sounding like a total newscaster I'm talking. <laughs> <laughs> Hello everybody, AJ here, and today I'm joined by Blanc Lorio. Is that what you like to be to be referred to as? <laughs> Juan. <laughs> Juan, all right, Juan. Blanc Lorio So actually, um, before this, I've, I've hardly even met you, so uh, I'll reintroduce myself. Sure. Uh, AJ, nice to meet you, sir. And so um, today Juan was gracious enough to come out with his time and uh, visit a uh, local EAA flight rally we've got going on. So we're flying a ton of kids today. I think we're gonna fly a little over 100 today. Wow, good and job. Then, uh, yeah, yeah, it's awesome. And then uh, we had a career day. So we had uh, pilots from all walks of aviation, including one, um, you know, military, uh, mechanics, all sorts of things um, here to talk to kids if they're interested in learning how to fly. So what I'm interested in is getting mm -hmm. a, a few little stories out of you possibly of um, things, because I noticed you don't talk about yourself on the channel a whole lot. Mm -hmm. um, and so I kind of wanted to get things that maybe uh, even your own subscribers uh, haven't heard of before. So. <laughs> The inside scoop stuff. What is? Hey, that, that, I'm a I'm a terrible fisherman, but I'll try here today. <laughs> so I heard that you bought an airplane at 15. Yep. How'd that happen? Uh, so at, at a dinner conversation, back in those days we had formal dinners where we actually sat down as a family yeah. and would eat dinner. Um, at one point, um, Dad suggested, you know, instead of buying your first car, why don't you buy a first airplane if you're going to do this aviation stuff because I was just constantly at the airport all the time working and washing airplanes and pumping gas in exchange for airplane rides in order and I was about 15 at the time um, and so that was just the last bit of uh, mm, emphasis or uh, impetus that I needed to consider going out and buying my own first airplane I didn't I wasn't thinking big enough I didn't I wasn't thinking it would even be uh, in the realm of possibility, but I knew the used airplane market really well, and I knew I could get into an airplane for less than four thousand bucks, and and uh, so I did. Uh, so again, with the help of the people from the airport, um, I was able to research the market and found that uh, DCO sixty five Taylor Craft for sale in Yuma, Arizona, for four grand. For thirty five hundred bucks. Thirty five hundred yeah. bucks. Wow. I had a thousand bucks saved up of my own money. I, I got a loan from mom and dad for twenty five hundred bucks at nine percent interest. And uh, then we, I had a flight instructor uh, that would go with me down to uh, Yuma. But I kind of had to buy the thing over the phone initially, uh, and then we had to make a decision once we got down there. And and uh, we went for it. We bought it. and We brought it home. And and then again, the, uh, a lot of the old timers at the airport helped me fix up what needed fixing up on it to make it airworthy enough to continue to learn to fly in and then i was able to solo on my 16th birthday and get my license in it when i was 17. that's so incredible i mean that's so encouraging especially i mean obviously the financial markets are 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 different but i think the effort is still there and it's still doable yeah, i mean it's still totally you can get it maybe not maybe not at 15 or... but but that's pretty incredible yep so did you have family did you have family in aviation was your dad a pilot uh, no i was not in a flying family um <laughs> Dad was an aerospace engineer working, well, he retired out of Aerojet early during the space race days, and he decided to become a gentleman Christmas tree farmer, retire early there at Grass Valley, but we lived right underneath the downwind for runway 25 at Grass Valley Airport. Mm. We were super into model airplanes as a kid, and uh, so super into aviation, knew all the aircraft types and makes, and that Grass Valley Airport has an air tanker base that got really busy during the summertime with launching all these great World mm. War II aircraft, like you, some of what you see out here, as air tankers. So that's what inspired us to go up to the airport instead of sit there and prune Christmas trees. <laughs> that's awesome. Grass Valley is a gorgeous place. Yeah. Gorgeous yep, place yep. To, to grow up. Mm -hmm. So um, what would you recommend to, to youth, maybe like high school age? What what should they do uh, to get into aviation? Because the way I did it is I would literally just come out to the airport. I would walk around until I found an that's open it. hangar and just talk to a guy. You broke the code. That's all there is to it. And I that's mean, primarily. Yeah. Yeah. You just get out to the airport and get involved, get engaged and start networking. You can't do this kind of a thing uh, at home on a computer. You have to make face-to-face -face contact. Aviation is a pretty small core group of people and the core group of people like you saw here today, that's going to be a network of people that th these folks are going to see throughout their entire career, those folks that successfully continue on with an aviation career. So get out to the airport, your local airport, and just get engaged and get involved don't mind these big fences around these airports these days. We didn't have these fences when I was a kid. We just <laughs> walk onto the airport, yeah. and and I, we just bugged them so much that they just eventually just 
put us to work. So do, in my case, washing airplanes, pumping gas, parking airplanes, until I was old enough to take on additional um, jobs. Uh, so that's the first step, is just get involved locally. So um, you're kind of a jack of all trades in aviation. And so one of my aspiring things is I, I think I want to chase licenses. Like I think it would be cool to, to fly a little bit of everything. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, so I'm going to read it here just so I don't, so I don't butcher it. But um, you're a mechanic. Mm -hmm. You've been an airline pilot, Air Force. Mm -hmm. um, you fly you fly Cubs, so you fly tailwheel, like bush sort of mm -hmm. uh, off-field stuff. Um, I've met Air Force pilots who are impressed by my tailwheel because um, what's interesting is like when you're in one lane, you don't get to experience the other. Mm -hmm. um, and so my question is, uh, what stories do you have um, where you've experienced one wall of aviation uh, that maybe blocks somebody from the next or, or maybe like weird conversion stories where, you know, an Air Force pilot finally hops into a, a Cub for the first time and, and something goes wrong? Or have you ever experienced anything <laughs> like that? Uh, well, you see that a lot in aviation. Um, in general, uh, those of us that grow up with general aviation, we tend to stay in general aviation mm. throughout our whole career. Many professional pilots will just be in general aviation enough to get their ratings and then move right on into the corporate world or the airline world, and they won't look back. Mm. They will just, they once they get to a professional level of aviation, they think that general aviation is just too sketchy or, or too many chances or too risky, a single engine aircraft. So they won't, they won't look back, they won't come back to it, and they, they some of that basic airmanship flying skills deteriorate, mm. in my opinion, as a result of it. Um, military pilots, <laughs> that's a classic example. You go straight off the streets to military pilot training and you're in jets your whole life, your whole career. You've never even flown a small airplane before. Wow. You throw you in a Cub, yeah, they're gonna be impressed because this thing's a damn kite and it's, <laughs> uh, and it's hard to maintain directional control in unlike anything they've ever had in their Air Force career. They don't know exactly what the rudders are used for in a light aircraft. So that's a big transitional period for a military guy if he wants to come back and enjoy some general aviation type of flying. So what on your, to switch gears a little bit, what on your channel made you want to cover crashes? Because you didn't start off doing aviation at all. And then yeah. specifically crashes, because I've been kind of nervous to do that, especially I don't have anywhere near the experience that you do to be able to analyze that sort of mm -hmm. thing. Um, but I've always been nervous of it because I don't know, it's just, I feel like it's a touchy subject. What, what made you want to do that? Well, I didn't want to initially, and until people started, I, until I started getting really positive feedback on it, um, and the fact that it was hoping to helpfully make a difference in aviation, mm. and in aviation safety. But so, so YouTube for me started out with motorcycles and just general hobby stuff. Then that Oroville spillway story broke, right. and that put the channel on the map. But I did it all, most of the filming from my airplane. So people started asking me more about my airplane. So I gave a little airplane content and then a, a, a big accident would happen and people would start to ask questions about it. And I'm, I was reluctant at the time to get into aviation accident reporting because A, I knew I'd have to be 100% correct all the mm. time. B, it's right. gonna take a lot of time, effort and research to get it right. Uh, and, and then C, I was concerned about my employer and how that would work with them. But in today's, world, we have so much data at our fingertips right away as soon as something happens is that with as much data as it is out there in real time almost immediately, you can put together just the facts of an incident very quickly. Data that we never, the acceleration, the speed of information today is so quick that that makes this concept possible. But I still had to overcome this huge stigma of well, let's wait until the final report is over. Well, that's gonna take you two years for yeah. the NTSB to put out the final report. And we already have all this data. We can already tell pretty much the facts of what happened now, and we can report on these facts now, and we can let people know what are we going, what are investigators going to be looking at. Right. So, from your Air Force days, mm -hmm. um, so you, you flew, uh, T-37s, right? Yeah, that's yeah. why we, I picked this yeah, here. Right. This is a Cessna T-37, and if you look at Harvey right over there, he'll show you in a second. About the same vintage, Harvey's 1959, you'll see some of the similarities between the two airplanes, because this was built by Cessna, the T-37. So, and then you instructed in the T-37. Right. So do you have any uh, interesting stories from, from the instructing days? Well, uh, I can just tell you that the the instructing that I did in the T-37 was way different than conventional T-37 instructor pilot. It was an unheard of program at Mather Air Force Base where we trained 
navigator students, the kids mm. that were going to go in the backseat of fighters, sure. we were giving them basic uh, 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 low-level navigation skills and um, aerobatic skills and formation flying skills in the T-37, which meant for us as instructors that we got to do all the flying from the left seat mm. while the poor uh, nav student was out there barfing his guts out in the right seat <laughs> while trying to learn these different skills. And so it, it was a really unique and interesting uh, flying club type experience. And we do full acro and spins training in the T-37. And so we never had it. I never had any major problems in the uh, the T-37 flying program, maybe only one engine failure or so in the T-37. We did have one instructor pilot that during a spin sortie over Bullard's Bar Lake in Northern California, this would have been in the mid 80s, uh, the aircraft did fail to come out of the spin. Um, the something on the elevator control broke and so they were forced to eject and they successfully ejected wow. out over uh, Bullard's Bar and were recovered just fine. And so wow. the Tweet was a very safe uh, and easy to fly trainer aircraft. Highest G onset rate in the Air Force, so you can G your lips off on it. Do you have any near-death experiences in aviation? And the only reason mm -hmm. I the only reason I ask that is because um, I feel like most pilots, especially with how many hours you have, how many do you, hours do you have actually? You lose track after a while once you get on with the airlines. Mm. So I went into the airlines with I don't know eight thousand hours. So it's probably getting close to fifteen or twenty thousand hours. Not sure. Um, airline flying has been very reliable. Uh, I've only had, in 24 years of airline flying, I've only had one uh, engine failure. Um, and that's, that's another good story. But as far as uh, almost getting wiped out, that would be uh, 19 years old. You're in, and, uh, it was the classic case, uh, that first 300 hours of your flying time, you are in the killing zone right there. I'm in there. that right now, so. so Listen up. <laughs> so there I was in my Taylorcraft that I bought for 3,500 bucks, and there's no data on the Taylorcraft because it's 1942. Mm. And um, so I'm flying out of Grass Valley in the foothills, um, and I'm pushing it farther and farther into the mountains. Um, and with the only 65 feeble horsepower, I'm learning to use ridge lift to. Um, gain my altitude in the mountains. So I'm getting more and more confidence uh, mountain flying in this Taylor craft. And then uh, I just took it too far, simply too far one day. And so we went up to Beckworth, California, and I was with uh, another friend of mine and I foolishly bought some gas. So I'm up at a high density altitude airport in the Sierra Valley of California in an underpowered aircraft and attempted to take off, um, again, with no data. The aircraft lifted off fine. I got plenty of lift off of the runway, but as soon as I got passed over the runway, a little bit of wind at the time, the aircraft simply refused to remain airborne. Mm. I was um, getting behind the power curve uh, because of density altitude. And uh, so the power lines were coming up ahead, and so I made a little 90 degree turn uh, to the south there, and I'm kind of at a crosswind situation. There's more power lines ahead of me, and um, looking over to my left, I can see the runway right there, and I'm thinking, nah, I think I'll just go back and head to the runway. First 300 hours, and the more I look back on it, the more I think, God dang, I was so lucky right there. I was just on the ragged edge of stalling and spinning that aircraft Ooh. in right there. And, and I, I just gently milked it around and got going downwind and smashed it back onto the runway at a very high rate of sink, busted the bungee cords and the propeller, bent the propeller of the aircraft, slid off into the ditch and uh, <laughs> got out of the airplane. Um, and didn't think a whole lot of it at the time. Well, we hitchhike home, uh, but the more I look back on it and the more I see these accident reports, the, the more I think about just how close that could have been to a, the classic stall spin, go back to the airport. And the reason I ask that question is a aviation's very safe. Like, and I don't say that to scare anybody. In 24 years, you've had maybe, let's say two, Maybe, or like one real incident, you think? Yeah, well, only one airline engine failure now, and then only the, the big incident there when I was 19 with the with the T-Craft, uh, flying C-130s for the military. He had four engines, so engine failure was just a routine part of the day, and, and yeah. that did happen quite frequently in the 130 world, but 
it was pretty much a non-event in a four-engine airplane. And the reason I say that, again, is, is I ask a question because it seems like everybody within that, like, 300, because I, I hear you say the 300, like, rule, and the I think you're zone. absolutely right. Yep. Um, and so the reason I ask that is because it seems like everybody's had one, like, near-death in that zone, mm -hmm. and then it totally cha like changes them as a pilot going forward. And so um, I, I had an experience like that uh, recently, and so and, and it totally, like, I think, changed how mm -hmm. I how I look at aviation and how I approach things um, and so yeah do you how do you think it changed you after that did you look at things well, a different way yeah or? You, the reason the 300 hours is the killing zone is because you don't know what you don't know mm. you've been given just the very minimalist amount of information to, required by the FAA to pass a check ride to get a private pilot's license, but there's a whole world of stuff that you do not yet know or fully understand of the stuff that can actually kill you. They don't train you on that stuff in your private pilot training. Yeah. And they teach you enough to kill yourself is what my grandpa always says. Potentially, yeah, potentially, yeah. yeah. And so that's why learning from other people's mistakes are so darn important. And yeah. it teaches you a new found respect for aviation once you have that close call. Yeah, and so my last question is, um, and what I, re I really like talking to people like you who've had this experience, um, and I've had some incredible mentors, mm -hmm. uh, you know, ex Air Force, Navy pilots, and I like hearing their stories because, like you said, I get to learn from those. Mm -hmm. um, and also, it's just entertaining to listen to some of those stories too, <laughs> honestly, and because uh, the human brain is wired for stories. That's how we've communicated for thousands and thousands of years, and uh, that's why I love hearing them. And so, um, I'm sounding like a total newscaster. I'm talking. <laughs> First time doing this. Um, at any rate, my last question. Um, uh, Although simple but serious, would you do it all over again? Oh yeah. And part two, would would you change anything about it? And part three, what would you recommend to anybody <laughs> well, wanting? That's a whole other video. Yeah, uh, I guess that's true. Okay, yeah. but so, in short. So part of the thing that we did here today was this was career day, and so we explained to kids about getting into aviation, and so I kind of used my mm, background or my story of how my aviation career went. And if you were listening. I told you many things that I would have done differently mm. or would have been more expeditious during that aviation career. But the main thing is you've got to enjoy the ride. There are gonna be parts of your aviation career which are not, not gonna be that great, but you gotta enjoy that ride because it's gonna take you to the next phase and the next phase and continue, hopefully, to improve uh, as you go along. Now go back and, and start with the, what was the basic part of that question again? So yeah, it was, would you do it all over again? Oh yeah, yeah, was, definitely do it all over again. And what would I do differently? Okay, so what would I do differently? Um, if I wanted to get on with the airlines, oh man, one big, here's, here's a classic example. What would I do, one big regret I had. There I was in AMP school uh, at Sacramento City College, hair down to here. And um, I had an opportunity to I was housed uh, at a, <laughs> a, a friend of the family was a base commander at McClellan Air Force Base at mm. the time. Yeah. And he suggested I should go cut my hair and go join the reserve unit at Travis Air Force Base and you can get straight into pilot training as a reservist. Mm. I blew it off. That was the opportunity. I did not, I didn't know what I didn't know. And that's yeah. one of the points I made today is one of the best kept secrets is the Garden Reserve. If you're going to go be a military pilot, at the time I thought I would just be a civilian guy and go through it the civilian ranking, the way, but the hiring was not there. Uh, the military is the way I ended up going. And there I had a great opportunity. I would have been a triple seven captain for the last 15 years had I listened to his advice and now here I am a triple seven FO all the way until retirement because of the difference mm. in seniority right. that, so the that word. one critical decision yeah. or indecision um, made for me so or created for me so that's a classic example of how I would have done things differently and better and that's why well, I like to come out here and try and explain these differences to kids these days and they they you may not understand it the first time through, but uh, keep listening to your elders and you'll get you'll get the idea. <laughs> One on that point, um, and not just you, because you have a wealth of information in aviation as, as well as some others, but like in any career, like whatever you're looking to do, whether you want to be a pilot, you're watching this video because uh, you're entertained or you wanted to hear more about um, Juan that you haven't heard on his channel before, um, you know, I love my favorite question to ask is is like what are your regrets and would you do it again? So mm -hmm. that's that's awesome to to hear your side of it. So well anyway, thank you, sir. I really appreciate it. Great. Have a safe flight Good home. Interview. Thanks so much for coming out today. All right, stay focused and get on that career path and get it done, man. Alrighty. See you later. See you here.